Hi, Dixie. Thank you very much for coming again You're to welcome. my interview. I have a uh, small or maybe not so small subject for tonight. Uh, I sent you two quotes, which I'm going to introduce in, inside this video. So the first quote was from the movie Natural Born Killers, and it's a very famous scene, the wedding scene. And it's going to, the link to it is going to appear right now in the upper right corner. Yeah. And the reason why I put this, many people don't realize that this scene very accurately portrays the contents of the wedding, which was actually in place 200 years ago, say, maybe older, like three, three or 400 years. We see no priest is present and no church. There are no witnesses. There are vows, vows taken for life. Like these kinds of vows, they don't, there isn't supposed to be an end to it, like a divorce or anything like this. They could only be some kind of a, a treason, maybe, but not a divorce. Yeah. And the second quote, which is going to appear right now in the upper right corner, was from a, a speech which Neil Postman gave a long time ago, whom I respect very much. I have all, all of his books, and I'm going to, one day I'm going to translate this lecture. And uh, this uh, episode, he specifically talks about the changing and shifting meaning of words, which we use in our everyday life, but we don't, don't realize very often that we use it sometimes in a shifted meaning and sometimes in, in directly opposite meaning. And what I'm going to ask uh, about two of these quotes combined is, I guess, some of the conflicts and misunderstanding around uh, dating, for example, or premarital sex or subjects around marriage. They all miss the point that technically the thing which we call marriage nowadays has little to do with the, the which was called the marriage like 200, 300 years ago. Almost nothing in common. O only the name remains, technically. I, I, I could rephrase Postman's words here, like uh, these things, they don't have anything in, in uh, nothing similar mm -hmm. to one another. So some professional could point to a hundred differences which has taken place since uh, I don't know, for the last uh, 200 years. But I, I, I chose to point to three, three key changes which occurred in our late times. And each one of these changes, even if it was taken by itself, it already would represent a tectonic change in the meaning of the word marriage. But I will name three. Uh, I think all of them are tectonic. The first one is divorce, no-fault divorce, which was not in place even... 50 years ago, maybe then. Actually, uh, the second, in, in the United States, it was Ronald Reagan who made that yeah, law. Yeah, so yeah. that was in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. In, the, in the USSR, it was made uh, in the 1918. Uh, the second thing is the pill, the female pill, since you don't have right. the, the male pill. And the third one, uh, well, I, could, I think I could quite accurately point and name our current system as matriarchy. And it's not used as a derogatory term or anything like that. It's just a scientific term. But there are signs which are named in any dictionary. What, what, what constitutes a matriarchy? There are certain, certain things that if, if they are in place, like three or four things, key things, then we can name this system a matriarchy. Like uh, lineage, material lineage, well, the, lo the location where children live, and they by default live with the mother, the bloodline, which is by default calculated by the female line. Well, there are some bloodline? other. I'm sure. I'm blood, not. I'm blood, sorry. I don't bloodline. understand. What do you bloodline. mean by calculated by the mother? What do you mean? I'm not sure what you mean by the bloodline. The bloodline being calculated by the mother. A woman more or less has a guarantee that the child that she produced at a medical clinic is hers. It's guaranteed by the procedures, by uh, oh, I see no one, okay. somehow. Okay. Uh, a man is presumed, under certain conditions, is presumed to be a father, you know, sometimes against his will or even in his absence. It's, in Russia, too, uh, that happens. But this is uh, one of the signs of a matriarchy in place, uh, just scientific term. So, uh, to go back to my main question, uh, how correct it actually is to call this current today system a marriage. Instead of what? 
I don't know, I guess if, if we are to be correct, there should be some other term, just not to mix those things, because otherwise, just like uh, uh, the public on the Neil Postman speech, uh, we can all laugh and say, the laugh is on us, because we say to each other next morning, yesterday I was on Mary and John's wedding, because technically I, I could not have been on the, on, the, on the wedding, because there is no wedding, in the sense that it was place like 200 years ago but i guess i'm a little confused because i don't think anyone is living today that lived 200 years ago and from my experience people don't study history very much i know you do a lot of people don't you know there's a saying that if you don't um, learn from history history you will be doomed to repeat it Human beings have always repeated it because they never remember. They don't study it. They don't study the Holocaust, so the chances of there being another one are probably good, and there have been in the past, even before the Holocaust. So, so to say marriage is not like it was then, it still means something now to people. People still have uh, somebody who marries them. They, they have the cake, and there's traditions about how all those things came about because there didn't always used to be a cake. Now there is. Uh, I think Queen Victoria is the first one historical figure in more modern times to wear a white dress for her wedding. Before then, it wasn't white, but people just copied her. So those, those things can just be kind of traditions, but marriage does mean something today. Most people get married. And in the clip that you showed, uh, I had actually never seen that movie, so I didn't recognize where it came from. But uh, what I would call what they did would be a covenant marriage. That's another term that some people are doing uh, where they make promises to each other and assume it's in front of God and they do their own thing. And the problem with that is uh, legally, because um, in today's world, if everybody was good, you wouldn't need anything that you have to get a license for. But people aren't. There's a lot of um, not very honest people. And if you don't have a record of it, that then when you want to split and there's joint property, there's joint children, it's a mess. If everybody was honest, you could everyone could just have a covenant marriage and just say, yeah, we're married. And they stay married and there is no problem. It's for, it's for the problems that we have to have the legal system this is what i think anyway because some people get mad and they say the, the government should have nothing to do with marriage it's it used to be something an institution of the church and and in studying marriage the main purpose of it was to protect any children born if, if it was just you and a woman and you get together and you never have children you just stay together it isn't as important for the protections to be there as it is when you have children and so there's my husband bob he does some of his practice he does uh, disability testing for the state of missouri where we live and one of the questions on the form they, that i give them that they have to fill out is is um you know are you married are you not married and and children and all that stuff so and and one of the questions that he has to ask them is why do you have to get a license to get married why do you have to? Do you have to in Russia? I know you do here. Well, you don't have to, but if, if you, you want, don't have to get a license. There, you there, do? Is, there is no. There are two types of marriage. First is uh, marriage by state. This is what called marriage, and the, the second one is uh, religious. And uh, uh, lately, church tends to uh, get people married in a religious way after they get the license from the state. Yeah, sometimes, that, sometimes it can be sidestepped, but most of the times that's right. the order. And in, in any case, the government or state or whatever has to have a record of you being married. So if anything happens, either you die and there's money involved and property and things like that, they will know who gets it. It's just orderly. But I am surprised how many times these patients have no idea why the state requires a license to get married. Usually they say things like, because they want more money, because it costs money to get the license. It's not very much, but they think it's all about money, and it has nothing to do with order. And it has more to do with order than anything, because there's chaos. 
otherwise. I don't know. Are we getting off the topic of what you meant by about marriage being what does the word mean today? I, I think there's marriage, um, uh, there's wedding shops, there's uh, people, wedding coordinators, and pretty well in this country, everybody thinks of marriage as you go in front of either uh, a, a, a state representative or a, a member of the, your religion, a clergy, and, they pref and they're licensed, the, the uh, ministers and priests are licensed to marry people. I can't just have my neighbor come over and perform. It has to be somebody that is authorized. And then you have that. And then you are, most people still take the last name of their husband. Not everybody, but most people do. And you become a family. And uh, you start your family with man and woman. And then you go from there. And you have children. You're all one family. It is surprising to me that that institution is, we have to say what it is now. It's in that sense. Ever in anything I've read, even back two hundred, three hundred years ago, you still had a ceremony where you bound two people together of some sort. A ceremony, and, yes, but not with the church involved. It was very late introduction. Perhaps, yeah, you're probably right. You know, I haven't actually studied that that much. I know that, you know... Even uh, witnesses were not required. They could be present, but not required. Yeah, and, um, yeah. And maybe it's because um, people are more dishonest. I don't know. Do you think people are just more dishonest now and you have to have... The more corrupt people become, or countries, the more laws you have to have to keep control. And if, if everybody, Sergei, if, if everybody in Russia, I know it's kind of a big thought, but if everybody in Russia was honest, nobody lied, which is a big one, and nobody stole anything, nobody committed any crimes, you would have to have very few laws. Um, you'd probably still have to have traffic laws because people make mistakes. They just make mistakes. You have to say, okay, when you come to a corner, you have to let somebody else go first before you go right or whatever the law is. They have lights and stop signs and things like that to have order. But people wouldn't have to ever lock their doors. There would be no prisons. Uh, banks, no, there would be no locks on anything because no one would ever steal. So you can see how in a, if it was a really good society, very honest people, very few laws, the more the more corrupt people become, the more laws, the more prisons, the more rules, uh, all that stuff. So the same is, I think, is true for marriage. Uh, by the way, Ronald Reagan said at the end of his life, one of the worst things he ever did was institute no-fault divorce. He said he did it so that he could get divorced from his first wife, Jane Wyman, easier. He made it easier on himself, and then he realized it basically meant that Marriage is supposed to be like a contract between two people. It meant that there's no contract. It'd be like if you buy a house and you could change your mind anytime you want. It's, it's, it becomes crazy. You, you don't have to, you don't, you're not bound by any real legal promises to each other. You can just say, oh, I don't like this. I've changed my mind. And you can get out. And with marriage, it affects so many people's lives that it's made it it's made it very uh, messy for a lot of people. It's, some people are married. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor was married eight times. It wasn't hard. It's not hard to get a divorce. It's easy. That's actually that's why I made the divorce one of the key points. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I was, I was talking about. It. But even this thing alone, the the possibility to go to just go away freely it changes the whole institution it does when I, it, do, it does when it I, when I, everything. when i uh, call it different from 200 years ago i'm not talking about ritual not talking about papers not talking about tradition i'm talking about the the essence what it is all about what is it for how it's supposed to be well, it's, all, it's, always it's always been about it's always been about legitimacy for children though instead of children who have no last name or the illegitimacy was a big thing 
back then. It could ruin your life forever if you were not legitimate. Now, nobody cares so much. Somebody, I heard somebody say that before that, uh, the marriage was about marriage. And after that, the marriage became the system how the divorce will be. So it, technically, it's, it's this regulation afterward. It's not about marriage. It's about divorce. So when you are signing a marriage license, you are signing some kind of a, a procedure which will be performed when you are divorced. So basically, you are oh, signing. That's a little, that's a little pessimistic. I, I got married a long time ago, and I'm still married. So. Well, talking on moss. Yeah? You know, it it it's tough today. It it really is tough. But that being said, uh, fascinating womanhood, which is what I represent, um, teaches women because women have. A huge, a huge uh, power in this relationship thing because women, as a group, tend to be more relationship oriented quicker than men. And women, when the marriage is so so not great, they will they will get worried about it quicker. When men get worried about it, it's usually when it's really bad. Now it's not hundred percent. Some men are very sensitive. I have a brother. He's very sensitive, and he's not like that. But more often, women are the ones that worry about relationships early on, and and they're not as they're not okay with things being sort of mediocre for long periods of time. And that's why women buy are the main ones who buy self help books. And um, so so, but we. We know, I don't just believe it, I know it because I live it, is that you can have a deeply romantic, happy marriage that lasts your entire life or the rest of it, whatever's left. And uh, you can have that because people do have it. The people who have it don't usually talk about it. It's very personal. And they don't, you don't brag about your relationship. The only reason I say anything about mine is because of what I'm doing. I have to. It's kind of uncomfortable because it's very personal, but uh, I need to be able to tell people because some people now think it doesn't exist. It's just a fairy tale or a myth, and it's not true. Some people have uh, married the love of their life, and they stay married their whole life, and they adore each other. And that's what we're, that's what we're helping people to do is to have that because if everybody had that, the world would be a much different place and a much better place. There would be no wars, I don't think. Now, I, I said that, and I think, well, I don't know, maybe. I, uh, but if everybody, if everybody lived like that, there'd be a lot more peace. Because peace begins in your own house. It doesn't begin out there. It begins when you get up in the morning and you greet the people who live with you, or, or if nobody lives with you, the people you meet first. And uh, when you're married, if you have that romantic relationship and your home is strengthened, your country is strengthened. In Russia, if every marriage was good, it would be a totally different place. Same, same with the United States. There is no country in the world that I've ever heard of that doesn't have significant marriage problems. It's bad. And it, whether you stay married and are just miserable or you just get divorced, there's a lot of deep unhappiness when it comes to marriage. And uh, it's sad because it doesn't have to be. Yeah, but those systems with, with divorce and without divorce are quite different. As far as I know, in Thailand at the moment, they don't have divorce, no fault divorce. There is no. And that's, that's the reason that when people say that you should marry uh, a girl from Thailand, most of them say you should not do it and do it in the United States. You should go and live permanently in Thailand because it's a completely different system. So mm. it, it works entirely. It's a different universe. Like then, there, there, a wife has to kill you somehow to get divorced. You mean uh, it, with adultery, she can't get divorced? I'm, I'm not sure about details, but I, I think not so easy. It, it would be it would be like like in any country a hundred years ago. It would not be easy anyway. No, it's what, not easy. You have, to prove, you have to prove infidelity, and that's sometimes hard to prove. 
and we, we could we could uh, try a, a thought experiment. So let's say Abraham Lincoln. Let's pretend he travels in our time by time machine, and he's a very marriage-oriented person and very cultural and very honest and and so on. And he gets familiar with our code, our family code, and how we practice it. Do you think he would say that's okay and he would enter this, or he would say you are all crazy and it's not a marriage? I, I don't know what. Why? Why are you calling this system a marriage? <laughs> I don't understand it. I would think he would think a lot of it was evil. I think he would be horrified at what he would see today. With, even from uh, the, even from a Christian point of view, I could I could figure a way it could be uh, i could make an argument that this current system is anti-christian for example in the bible they say that the husband is the head of the household mm -hmm. and, and now everybody knows that a woman has more power in the household altogether i mean combining well economic, children women, and women psychology all... psychology Women have always had a great deal of power. They have seldom ever known how to use it effectively. I'm not talking about brute force or being a real pain and, and yelling and anything like that. I'm talking about feminine, uh, feminine power, which I talk about in my new book. It's completely different from male power. And the reason that we believe that this head of the house thing is, is not meant, ever meant to be a dictator slave kind of mentality. Some people have use that as an excuse to treat people like that. But I don't think in Christianity, when it was uh, the prophets who wrote about that, ever meant for it to be master-slave. Because you don't want to treat somebody you're in love with like your slave. And when you're talking about ideal situations, because in a, in a marriage, like in any company, you have to have people who or in different positions. If everybody, if there were 10 presidents of the company, it would be chaos. So in, in my new book, I talk about different types of leaders. And in this case, a man is more of a task leader. They tend to be good at it. They, um, they, they're more interested in getting the job done rather than worrying about how people feel while they're getting the job done. And women tend to be natural at being relationship leaders and companies have relationship leaders they don't call them that but they have people who are concerned at um, human resource departments or kind of like that where they they have people that are hired to make sure that people are productive in their jobs and that things are going smoothly not just that they're getting the job done but that people actually stay and don't leave and they don't have to keep replacing them with new people and so in, a, in an ideal family with father as the head of the house, so it doesn't mean he's a dictator. It means that he leads out. And in some situations, it's the reverse, whereas the man is kind of naturally more suited to a relationship leader and woman is kind of an alpha female. And some of those relationships work. But more often, it's man is more a uh, task leader, task-oriented, getting the job done, and woman is more relationship. Because women, men don't have babies. Women are the only ones who have babies, and they're, they're the predominant group of people who raise babies, meaning that whether you work full-time or not, put your child in daycare, uh, preschool, those are predominantly run by women. So women give birth to and raise almost everyone who's ever been born. There's exceptions, but by far, overwhelmingly by far, women do. And so they're natural at relationship oriented. They care about how their baby feels. Uh, they care about whether people are fed, not whether there's enough food to eat. Uh, whereas men are, are really good at task leaders, and men don't have babies. They have to do something. They, they, they go out and they protect their families. This didn't used to be hard years ago because life had a lot more survival to it like when um and, it, and if we ever had a huge catastrophe and we lost all of our modern conveniences it very quickly fall back into that where men are out doing the heavy lifting plowing fields things like that and women are uh at home churning butter washing clothes doing all the reason it fell to them is because it was natural 
it was it would be unnatural for that to reverse it. But now when you go into big corporate office buildings, the women can dress up and go in there and sit there and type and do all these things, be, be an attorney, appear in court. But there's a lot of things women can do that they don't have to compete with physically with men. And they they can do that. But they they kind of trade putting their children in daycare, letting other women pay other women to raise their children, basically. Uh, sure, they get them on evenings and weekends, but a lot of women find themselves, whether they want to or not, feeling like they must do this. Um, they must do this this way. So when you talk about you know, being in charge and all that stuff, it, 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 it's kind of gotten uh, messed up today because of so many jobs that women can have because we have all these conveniences. We have cars. We don't have to go out and, and uh, bridle, put a big bridle on a horse, catch him in the field, hook him up to a, a cart or a wagon. Uh, those things were more suited to men. They did those things. And it, women, just you mentioned the pill before, that has allowed women to be as promiscuous as men. So it's really messed up. Women used to be the ones to put the brakes on because they didn't want to have a child out of wedlock. And now they can they can do the exact same thing, and um, the problem is it has not made anybody happier. The pill is 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 a serious topic. Uh, pill. Some people argue that technically, after the pill was introduced, women became a different species. Yeah, some nothing less. Yeah. And and if they became a different species, then old rules. I would say might not apply anymore so well. Well, both, some women, I mean, both well, to women and to men. Yeah, there's there's millions and millions of women and millions of men, and they're not all alike. I never use the pill. I never use anything, but I'm kind of different. And uh, I came from a a family with a lot of medical doctors, and I knew there were side effects. I didn't want that, so I didn't do that. But I but all my my daughters have, uh, and I understand it, but um, my, and most of my family who's used contraception has done it to space out their family, not so that they can be promiscuous with no consequence. But that's personal choice, but it's possibility that, that uh, women now have. They do, and, and, men, and, it's, and, and they men, are, men don't, by the way. And they are unhappy. They're unhappy. I mean, the, the reason fasting women exists is because of misery. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't need to do this. And uh, the fact is, I mean, people can argue those things all day long, but marriages are not better, and people are not happier. I, I read a, do you know who the journalist Barbara Walters is? Yes, actually, uh, okay. Neil Postman was mentioning it. Yeah, yeah she, uh, she interviewed my mother years ago, but she, I read her book that she wrote, and she said that she was a virgin when she got married because nice girls did not do that. There was always the risk of pregnancy. And socially, it was considered really low-cap class. People would whisper about you, you know, if you were sleeping around. You were considered very low status to do that. It's completely changed. I just uh, showed to my son this movie, a great movie called uh, Riding in Cars with Boys. I haven't seen that. I don't remember the actress by the name. It's not the point. The, the, they show uh, a bit in the past, and, and it's, uh, it's a huge event, uh, a pregnancy before out of, of wedlock. That's a huge event, which puts a shadow, kind of, on the on entire family, including mm -hmm. father and mother and, and you know, sisters and so on. But, again, talking about the pill, the reason I, I uh, put this comment yesterday, <laughs> okay, don't, don't, I will not mention it, but if you don't have the pill, then, yeah, I guess you, you could expect that uh, uh, a girl is, is uh, a virgin and she's going to be married. Yeah? So when she declines propositions of sex, it's understandable why. At the same time, if we are talking now, like in, in the movie, uh, the girl was... I don't remember, 16 or 15, something like this, high school. So now we are talking about, say, 30 years of age, a woman. She's clearly 
well, 99%. She, she's, she's not a virgin, and you are not her first. And she says that she's going to decline sex before the marriage. It looks kind of absolutely illogical to me. I don't know. I don't know. Sex is pretty intimate. You don't get more intimate than that. And a person can decide at any time, you know, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be this other way. And even if she has had a little bit of experience, she can change her mind about doing that because is there anything more intimate than that? I don't, I can't think of anything. It's very yeah. extremely personal. It's extremely personal. And for people to do that when they don't even know a person is really kind of still kind of boggles my mind that you would let somebody use your body when you don't really know them. And why use, use it, it, it's mutual. Why, 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 why there's a use? It's mutual. Why you use each other. You use each other's bodies when you don't really know each other. It's, it's yeah. like, you know, when you when you think about it, it's your body. It's not just no, but well, not very many people would go down to the mall naked and walk around. You'd be embarrassed. But yet they let someone see their body who they don't even know, really, and they let them see it and touch it. And you know, if it's a stranger, you think you know no. But then you go and you have a fun time, and then you. Let them see and touch you. That's a huge jump from this to this in a very short amount of time without really knowing them. I mean, you, there's sexually transmitted diseases. This is how babies are born. <laughs> this is, even if you prevent it, this is the method that is, uh, that, that is used to have babies. Animals don't. You know, like uh, some of these big African animals, they only mate when the female is in heat. They don't. Well, she won't let them. Otherwise, she's yeah. That's that, so, in this way. People are very, very different from animals. Yeah, she's yeah. she's uh, the female lion. Go away. You know, she's not in heat. Forget it. The only reason they have sex is to have babies. Same with elephants, and uh, there's probably some species that don't. But generally, females only let males have sex with them in order to reproduce. Human beings are a little different. They do it for fun. And uh, it, it, still has, it still has side effects because, like I think I said in another video, for women, when you have sex with somebody, your body produces a lot of chemicals, pleasurable chemicals like oxy, oxytocin. And oxytocin. And men produce it too, but the testosterone they also produce blocks some of it. So they don't get as bonded from having sex as women do. And when women get bonded from having sex with somebody that they don't know, they don't understand when it's a one night stand and he uh, is off to the, to the next one. And it, it, women get broken hearts from this kind of stuff and they don't even know why. It's hard on them emotionally. You know, honestly, I have personal trouble with this uh, hormonal explanation <laughs> because, yes. you know, uh, if you can explain some peculiarities in behavior of women by their hormones, like that, yeah, they cannot do anything about it, it's just how they are by nature and so on. The same thing should be in this case applied to men. They also have hormones and they also have the influence and it's a huge influence. Actually, I guess most women have no idea how big this influence is starting from like 12 or 13. When, uh, it's actually hard to imagine if uh, a normal uh, a boy uh, comes through puberty, say at 13, and then she's going, he's going to marry at uh, 23, 25. 23 is a, is a time when the testosterone starts a slow decline, so he's already past his peak sexual. So he he sh should have should have had uh, like uh, seven years of very active experience by the time, and we are telling him that now you, you you can marry and have some fun it's absolutely from testosterone point of view it's absolutely crazy and yeah but it, you know we, we were talking about this the other day just because just because uh i feel like eating cheesecake doesn't mean i should eat it because i will get fat if i eat it 
And so what I do is I don't say I will never have cheesecake. I limit how much I have because I want to be fit. So just because you have drive, we need to control ourselves. Like, I don't feel like getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning sometimes. I do it because I need to, because I want to accomplish something better. All human beings, to be a, a really, to have a really uh, good self-esteem, a good life, you have to control yourself. On many, in many areas, you have to get up. You sometimes are tired and you go without sleep to get something done. You go without food when you're busy or like a mother, she'll go without food and feed her children first. We, we can do, human beings can do these things. Animals don't tend to, they don't, if they're hungry, they don't tend to share while they go hungry. Human beings do. That's one of the things that separates us. But just because you have urges and drives doesn't mean there should be no bridle on it. Like it should be a wild horse and not tamed at yeah, all. Yeah, but, but by, cultural, by cultural standards, it should be zero. Yeah, like before, until marriage. And it's absolutely against nature, like uh, 200% if it's possible. Yeah, it is, but some people do it. And it's, how not do you like, it's, not, it's not like you, you're allowed to have a little bit. You are not allowed to have anything. Like cake, cake analogy, there are no cakes in, in nature. <laughs> but, but sex is on the, on the bottom level of the Maslow pyramid. Bottom, together with food. That that's how how essential it is actually. For me, food is food is really tough because we all get hungry. We get hungry more than one time in a day, and yet um, you can't go without food. Like um, people with eating disorders, and to me, it's got to be one of the probably the toughest addiction because you can't eliminate food. You have to learn to control. And you like, actually, that's a great point. I, I will forget it, so I will tell it. I, I had experience with uh, long fasting. Well, right? you're completely abstinent of, of, of food. My my record is uh, 20, 28 days. Uh, Did you you had water though, right? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Like uh, each each uh, each other day. Sometimes. Did you, why did you do it? Uh, for partially for for experience on myself, partially for uh, healing, because there, are, there is some information that it uh, mm -hmm. has a, a, a very positive in, impact on your health in general. But that, that's not the point. Um, I guess to, to illustrate to a woman what it is like to have a sex drive and not have it for years, they should stop eating. On the third, third day, approximately, there comes this uh, very special phase, which is, it has a special name. Uh, you're, go you're going to be so hungry that it's, you're going to be like half crazy about it. And this, this third day is where most of this, how it's called when an alcoholic suddenly starts drinking again. There should be a term for this. Oh, <laughs> like a snap, okay. a snap. Yeah? So yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, when they start drinking again, they're, they're just as hooked as they were before. And this third day, you can snap really easily. And mm -hmm. it's because it's the hardest part. After that, it declines a little bit. It, it never goes away, but there is nothing, nothing uh, more intensive than this third day. So I would suggest some women to just to illustrate how it is to go on hunger, like for five days, say. What now, Sergey? Women, women have sex drives too. I guess not, nothing even close, I think, to what men have. If, if we, are, we are talking about testosterone, 20 times is the norm. Like if we, 20, 20 times, men have 20 times the, the usual norm of a female. I lost my train of thought. That's but all right. That, that, that could be, I, I, I sometimes try to describe when, when, when I speak with some women about it, I try to describe this feeling as a, like, a, imagine that you have a second kind of hunger. And if, and in this sense, you are always hungry, always. But most women they they can't even imagine what it is like to to live constantly in this state of mind. It's like a uh, maybe it's a bit overblown or derogatory, but I sometimes uh, describe women in in a marriage, especially as a as a drug dealer. Like we have a drug addict, 
and you have a drug dealer, and they have this <laughs> relation in the in the in the sexual uh, sphere. So, and it's not a very healthy relationship. Yeah, you know, a, a, a drug addict and a drug dealer. It's uh, not. A, they're not equals. It's, uh, it's a little bit of a sort of a pessimistic way to look at it, I think, a little bit, because some, in, in, a, in a great marriage, it's joint. You both, because for women, uh, sex, more often, you use it to express love. It's not just for itself. It's romantic. And so it's part of the relationship. And it deepens love. It isn't just about chemical, physical. It's about emotional, too, and even spiritual for women. When they are in love is when they are wanting to express their love that way. And, uh, and I think when you, when you have that deep kind of a relationship, every time you have sex, it's more meaningful than if you just have it with a stranger or somebody you don't even know, where there's no... There's no actual relationship going on with that person. Uncommitted sex isn't anywhere near as deep or strong as committed when you're in a good relationship. Otherwise, you can have, I don't know, how can I describe it? Kind of like um, you can eat junk food all day long. and In America, they were notorious for serving huge portions of things. But then if you ever have a really beautifully cooked meal, small portions of something that's exquisite. You want to slow down and eat it slowly because it's so good. You don't want to just have, give me a whole bunch of this because you're just hungry. You, something, if something is exquisite, it tastes better and feels better and you don't want to hurry through it. I'm trying to, hey, look who's here. How are you doing? <laughs> Hey, Sergey, how are you doing? <laughs> you guys have a good visit? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, so you're maybe missing that one element of when you have a relationship with a woman that you're deeply in love with, every sexual encounter is deeper and more meaningful than a superficial one. You need way more of them to do for you what one really committed one will do. I remember now what I wanted to say about this. Okay. I wanted to, uh, that's only from my personal experience, but I know for a fact from my, from my marriage and from experiences uh, afterwards, uh, I realized uh, quite early actually in my marriage that sex is not the most uh, intimate thing <laughs> which goes between two, two people. It's, uh, it, it's, it's deep enough, but it's, it's, Definitely not the deepest thing that was going it's on. It's not deep. The it's thing. not deep, but it's very personal. I mean, it's uh, it's very physically intimate. But sharing sharing with somebody your deepest fears and desires is probably the most personal you ever get. Because you can have sex with a prostitute and they don't even know your name. Uh, but you you can't when you give your heart to somebody and you trust them with all the things that you carry from your childhood that um, some that were good, some that were things that scared you, you wouldn't trust with just anybody experiences you've had. And, and even the fears you have in your life today, you trust somebody with that in there. It's somebody um, who can be a witness to your life and they're faithful and loyal to you. There's nothing like that. And so if you're, if you talk about, having casual sex with lots of people that won't get you that relationship that is the best relationship a person can have is with one committed person who deeply loves you actually and i was not i was not talking about uh, the promiscuity that doesn't mean anything but but i, I was talking about that it, it could be it could it could have nothing to do with the marriage as, as we know it at the moment. Like, 
marriage is a different different orbit well, even in marriage but in marriage today uh, people expect that you won't cheat that's why it's called cheating yeah but there is no law about it and there is no well, fault well, again well, there used to be there used to be but it was impossible to enforce you couldn't prove it it used to be illegal to commit adultery uh, now I mean it's just it's just too hard to enforce too many people do it so there's not enough I law guess, enforcement. I guess somehow they managed to uh, they had uh, what they called illegitimate children so somehow they were traced illegitimate children there's no stigma for that today at least not here is there there if you if you were illegitimate and uh, even when I was a child it could hurt your chances of being successful your whole life, even though the child had absolutely nothing to do with it. They yeah, got yeah, because, because there, was, there were differences by law, and now there aren't any. Yeah, so... That's, again, the meaning changed. The name mm -hmm. stayed the same. Yeah, I mean, you know that, but I guarantee you most people out there don't study history. They only see what it is today. Uh, otherwise, we'd see that we're repeating history in a lot of political situations now. And people think, for example, here, they think, some people think socialism is a good idea. They don't look at other countries who have tried it, and it isn't so great. They don't look at the downside. They don't look at all these things. They just, they think it's a brand new idea. And it's, it's as old as time. This kind of stuff has always been going on. It cycles around, and people don't read it. They don't study it. You study marriage, and so you know some of those things, but most people don't even care about that. They care about what it is today, and they care about whether they're happy. And when they're not happy, they have no idea. I know people who I've known for years that have women have no idea the mistakes they're making in a marriage, and I'm certainly not going to tell them. It's not my place. Uh, but I can see a lot of times little things that add up and um and it it keeps them more distant from their husband because they do these things and no one has ever taught them the, the kind of damage that does over time like you say the woman being the drug dealer some marriages are like that and you're right some are like that but some are very different than that too some are where the husband is um, very abusive. and uh, It used to not be illegal for a man to rape his wife. Now it's illegal. Actually, there wasn't, as far as I know, there wasn't, there was no such thing as a, a rape inside the marriage because there was... That's right. It was, yeah, that's right. It's by law. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It wasn't even considered that, even though it actually was. Uh, men had basically had in some ways, legal ownership of a woman when he married her. When he married her, any property she had belonged to him. When when Bob and I got married, uh, I called the bank one time. He asked me to call to see a balance of how much was in there. They would not tell me how much money was in there. They had to have him. Even though it was a joint account, I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to get, the amount of money in there, even though I was on the account. Karen uh -oh. Strong had this lecture that she described what is called the coverture law and how, and how and why it was established. Very interesting lecture. I should send you a link. Yeah, that was, I, I was like, what? <laughs> you know, and I thought it was weird then, but I was newly married and I had never had, except I had my own little bank account when I was a teenager. I got married at 19. So I didn't, I didn't have a lot of experience with those things before I got married. And it was a few years later. It took a few years after that before I could call the bank and uh, get a balance. Women didn't, women didn't have those rights. And it's, it's gotten to the point where women need those rights because there's too many men who abuse it. And there's too many women who abuse other things. So... It's the de it's decaying society that is making it necessary to have more laws and more control.
Don't you so, think it changes the whole nature of the marriage? Like maybe this is a small thing. Like now yeah. a wife yeah. can can have her own account and uh, uh, separate finances, but this even this small thing is is a huge change if you take an institution. When, when George Washington married his wife Martha, uh, perhaps you know about his life. He was uh, she was married before, and her husband died. And she had, I think, four children, but two of them died. I can't remember how many were still living when she married him. But she was one of the wealthiest people in the colonies then. And she had this huge plantation. And she needed to get married because she couldn't run it by herself. She hired an overseer, but then she had to trust him. So in those days, women didn't... Um, they didn't stay unmarried for long because they needed to have a man. And, and men needed to have a woman to have children and have his family. So when they got married, he kind of inherited his plantation and hers, and he became one of the wealthiest people in the colonies. But Martha was a little unusual because legally it's all left to her. A lot of times women couldn't inherit, but the way it was with her husband, she inherited that, and so she had all control. She still wanted to remarry soon. I, I don't think it was very long when her husband died when she married George Washington. And, uh, and he needed uh, to be established. He needed to kind of settle down. And as you probably know, he didn't, they didn't have any children of their own. Nobody knows exactly why. But um, he legally owned all of her property when she married him. But it didn't bother her because she knew that he was loyal, that he would run it. She didn't want to run it. It's hard. They had all these slaves, and some people think, oh, you just sit around with a fan and slaves do all this work. They, she worked very hard. They had to take care of these people from the time they were born until they died. And they had to provide medical care. They had to provide clothing and food. And uh, when a man got very old, they had, he stopped working. He basically, they had to pay for him to be retired. They didn't work 75-year-old men or women. They, they just kind of stopped working. And so Martha had a huge job in organizing all the meals and all of the people. She had to organize every year clothes made for every single person made sure they had shoes, made sure they were attended to with medical needs. And so she had a huge job. If she didn't have a husband, she wouldn't really have a partner. He managed the, the, uh, the land and all the shopping. They, they ordered most of their stuff from England in those days. And he managed all that and had to ride. Uh, he'd ride along the fences to make sure fences were okay. He did all that man stuff. She was incredibly busy. I don't know how women did it in those days. I, I really don't. Um, my assistant, Jenny, just yesterday said she wished she lived in 1940. It would be easier. And I said, I think you're picking the good things from 1840 and not the bad. There would be no antibiotics, no deodorant, <laughs> no toothpaste. There would be... A lot of the stuff you take for granted, no air conditioning and no heat, no inside heating. You have to have a fireplace. And there were all these horse accidents and people didn't live the, um, you didn't live as long, you died of all kinds of stuff you don't die of now. And uh, anyway, we, we often compare their best with our worst. And we think we wish for that when it's, it's always a mixed thing, what you get. If you take marriage 200 years ago, there'd be things we'd like about it and things we'd probably hate about it, too. I guess so, but my point was, uh, the initial point was that it was a different thing altogether. Like, yeah. for example, if you, t if you take, uh, it sometimes happens, uh, it's possible to, in Russian at least, uh, I can get a book by some saint who lived, say, 300 years ago, and he had uh, a very famous and huge lectures uh, uh, 
sermons yeah, about about marriage and lots of advices what to be how it should be done how it should not be done and so on whatever she is writing of if i'm reading it today technically it does not apply because he was reading it for a different system because everything was different so his advices and his uh, approaches they, they 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 are nothing now absolutely nothing because this marriage that he thinks of and describes it's just absent. It's it's no longer available. I know maybe in some third world country somewhere. Maybe I don't know. I guess you if you could tell me some of the things you read that is very different. Actually, it it doesn't really matter what exactly whatever he has written. It's really hard hard to untie this uh, these advices from the household economy because they were all in, in intertwined. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot or anything. I just hadn't read that, so I was curious. Um, but it is it is quite different. People are different, and yet they're not different. I read things from 200 years, Elizabeth the first time in England, and read some of her writings, and I think, boy, people aren't very different. They still get upset about the same things. They still long for certain things that are the same, and you can feel a connection with people that lived long, long ago, even though their culture was different, their food was different, and their, just the way they get through their day was different. Like they didn't take baths like we do. Uh, they didn't have really plumbing or, uh, you know, this whole idea med medically of bleeding somebody sounds really weird to us. We don't, we don't do leeches on people and, uh, bleed them for every time they get sick my my brother said that there are still sometimes you bleed a person for certain things but i've never known anybody it's certain can't remember what it was they said that it's helpful to do that but it's some rare thing they used to do it all the time so a lot of things are different um couples husbands and wives children didn't if you had 12 children the chances of all living to adulthood was slim so in those days, when you had marriage, you also had a lot more death. There was a lot more uh, infant mortality. There was a lot more women who died in childbirth. That was something they had to deal with. And when women got pregnant, they had to plan in case they didn't make it. And if they died, if they had any other children, it would put a huge strain on the father who was left. Or if there was no father, if he was killed in a war... It was, like you say, that some things are very different. When, when a woman announces she's going to have a baby, she doesn't assume, what if, what if I don't live or my baby doesn't live? It's usually a joyous thing. It's not like, well, you know, and the baby dies when it's three days old. And we don't, you know, you look at those parishes in, in Europe and uh, recording births and deaths, so many babies that die in infancy. And so many women that die in childbirth, we don't so much have that. So that one thing right there would change the dynamics of marriage. And that isn't a little thing, it's a huge thing. And it, tend, it tended to draw people together, uh, partly for survival. We don't worry as much about just straight surviving. Some, in some countries, I'm sure people still do, but uh, where you live and where I live, we're not worried whether we're going to die next week because of here in the early days, like uh, Indian attacks or outlaws or stuff like that. When, when a women here, it's probably the same in Russia. Tell me if it isn't, but women here, can, I could get in my car and drive to New York city and women often do it and will do it alone. It was considered supremely dangerous before fast cars, not those early cars that went 25 miles an hour, and to, to go, because there's outlaws, there's robbers, and, and you could be attacked. I mean, you still could be with cars, but they're fast. And then you stop at a gas station, you get your gasoline, and you go. But uh, So that changes everything, too. Women can drive for days. I drove from here in Missouri to Arizona, which is two days, by myself to deliver a car for our daughter. 
and then I flew back. Um, I, as I was driving, I was thinking, I could never have done this 100 years ago, because, or 150 years ago. It was too dangerous. I made even then I made sure I drove in daylight hours and not at night with you know people drinking and stuff like that. But it, it when you talk about marriage changing, everything that happens like that changes can change the dynamic slightly. Not not as much infant mortality has changed things a lot. Um, women having, like you said, birth control changes things. It allowed women to be promiscuous. Most women weren't because they didn't want, women are the ones that get stuck with being pregnant with a baby. Men can run off and women didn't. They, they were more careful because they, they were the ones that would be left behind if they fooled around and, and then they got pregnant. Some of them don't even know who was the father. How can you even, in those days, you couldn't even prove for the father, who the father was, so no one was held accountable. Actually, so, today it's mo almost the same story. You have... Well, there's but, DNA. But, yeah, but you, DNA, if, if you have, uh, if you if you think that could be the case, and if you get the permission, and in some countries you need a permission by law, or by mother, or by both, otherwise it's a criminal offense, like in France. It's a criminal offense to do a DNA test on your own child as a father. That's, that's the reality we are living now. Oh, you mean if you're the father? Yeah. Is that true here in the United States? I don't know. Maybe in some states. I don't know. I don't know. That's new. I, I've never been through that, so I don't really know. If, if Richard were here, he's an attorney. He'd probably know. <laughs> what, I don't know. What's, what's, what's strange about this, that this, uh, the mechanism for DNA testing, it could be a, a revolution. It could eliminate all possible doubts about paternity, which were throughout right. history. And it's r relatively cheap now. It could be done mandatory at the medical facility on, on birth. And it's not done. <laughs> not well, it doesn't need to be done if you know, your, you know who the father is. It's your husband. It's a waste of money if you don't need it. But, you know, all of the things I've heard you say about men not having rights and things like that, I've heard other men talk about it. If they talk enough about this, there'll be some adjustment in the laws. There just has to be. There will be. But the truth is, until people are more moral and good, you cannot make enough laws to control people. You just can't do it. There's too many ways to slide around and be corrupt. There's just too many. But certainly just like women needing to have stalking laws, they needed to happen because there was too many guys that were stalking women. So they had to make these laws. In an ideal society, there would be no need for that because no one would ever stalk anybody. But it, it's not ideal. And so if men are getting taken advantage of, too many men get taken advantage of, they're going to, probably change those laws too, but it won't really solve it as long as people are corrupt because there'll always be some new way to be corrupt. And so what we work on is ourselves to become better people, not others. And that's what Fascinating Woman has about working on yourself because you cannot change another person. But you can change you and no one will complain if you change you in a good way. And, uh, it's perfectly legitimate to work on yourself all day long. You don't offend anybody. <laughs> and, and it's the only way, and, and what people don't understand is when you change for the better, when you get rid of some weakness that you have, you work on it, you overcome it, it affects people around you for the better. It just does. You don't necessarily try to do it. But it does. If you've ever been around a person that is uh, a really good influence, it affects you. You want to change. You want to be like them. Uh, and that's, that's what our goal is, to try and change ourselves. And with changing ourselves, accepting people for who they are, where they are. Accepting, I'm, I'm having a real hard time on the Fascinating Womanhood group teaching this concept to women about accepting a man at face value. 
because they think accepting him means that they have to agree with everything. It has nothing to do with whether you agree with it. It means you accept him as he is today uh, with all of his weaknesses and flaws. And if you can't accept him, don't marry him. But if you've married him, then you need to accept him. And accepting him doesn't mean that if he does something rude, that that's fine. It is, you still have boundaries. But accepting him means you don't, you don't set out to try and change him. Let's see, how can I make him better? Don't make him your project. Does that make sense? You make you your project, and him, you look for everything good about him, and we're, we're coming up with a new uh, love book for women to write in where it specifically tells them to look, it helps them to treasure hunt for things. Like, um, did he say a great joke? You write it in there. You're constantly looking for things. Uh, something kind he did for another person. Some wise thing he said. And there's all these prompts in there that you fell out for the guy you love and you become a better person and and the odd thing is, as you become, as you accept and really love another person, they tend to, they tend to relax and actually be their best self. Not because that was your goal. It can't be your goal. Your goal has to be yourself. But it, it's an influence. Just like if you're around a person that's really optimistic, for example, a person that's just really got a lot of charisma and they're honest and sincere. It makes you want to be that way. When I was a kid and I saw that movie, Ben Hur, did you ever see it? Sorry, what, no. what's the name? Ben Hur with Charlton Heston. It was 1959. Okay. It has the big chariot race in Rome. I guess it's in Russian, it's called Ben Gur. Okay, yeah. Oh, awesome. well, when I was a little kid and my parents took me to that, it really affected me. I came out of that theater and I wanted to be this amazing person because like I saw the main character as being such a wonderful man and he was so good. I thought, I want to be like that. I want to be really good because it affected me uh, seeing the story. Same thing is true with you or me. If we, if we become or work on becoming uh, this person that has is really honest and honorable and who cares for people and is not looking out for themselves all the time people around you will they won't necessarily tell you but they start to be influenced by you and the same thing is true as if you're a criminal let's say a wicked person somebody who let's say you're a well not you but say somebody is a is a murderer the people that are around them in their lives they that person affects them in kind of a dark way. Uh, even if they're not talking about it, their dark darkness about them has a tendency to kind of influence other people. And so does light. That's darkness. We're talking about light. And we can work on ourselves. And it's it feels good. It actually feels good to be have yourself a project, to to exercise, to uh, to do something, make it a mission to do something kind for somebody every day that you expect no thank you. Just some little thing. I mean, it could be smiling at somebody or helping them with something, opening a door. Um, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of things we can do for people that lifts them up and you, you have more light around you. I'm not talking about physical light, but you're more of a light person and people will want, will be drawn to you. And I can't, that's a fantastic way to live. You know, we've kind of gotten off topic here, but I'm all about fascinating womanhood and we are about positive and that's why I don't, I don't really, I don't really like it if women post negative things about their husbands on there because this isn't, um, this isn't a husband bashing thing. We don't really support that. But I don't want to bash them either. So we try to redirect them to something else rather than say, hey, don't do that. We try to use teaching opportunities 
to help them to not do that because fascinating womanhood is all about accepting a man at face value, not saying, my husband's a real creep. He does this and this. I, I don't, it's not, it's not helpful. It won't help anybody, especially the person saying it. I'd rather we put things on there like, tell me something, um, tell me something brave that your husband did today. He went out in the cold and it was 20 below. Well, it's almost summer, so that's not going to happen right now. But he, he, went, he went out and worked all day even though he didn't feel good. He was tired. You can think of all kinds of things. I, I hope you find somebody like that, Sergey, because there's women out there. I know there are. That are um, that are light, that are that would love you and support you, and um, think you're the best thing that ever happened. Could be, but I'm not in active search. That's that's definitely. It's really definitely. hard to search for. It's really hard to search for it. You kind of kind of has to kind of have to just see it when it's there. And maybe you haven't had that opportunity yet, but I hope that you do. Because there's nothing like it. Could be. I, I don't swear off. Uh, never to. But, yeah, I'm, I'm not, not, not going to it either. <laughs> yeah, and I, I understand that. I mean, people get really burnt and uh, their lack of trust. Uh, I have a brother who's been married twice and he's quite afraid of it right now and he hasn't he hasn't found anybody that's really a good choice for him yet but um, he's wonderful he's a great guy but I understand being gun shy he's very gun shy it's not even about being being um, uh, having a wound it's just a pure economical risk yeah, you risk your time, you risk your uh, finances and assets, and the results are not guaranteed in any way, but the risks are guaranteed. And I have uh, a child to care of, so... How old is your child? Uh, 16? 16, yeah. So first things first, if he's going for higher education, then I'm going to have to support him for next seven years, say, more. What would you like, what would you like to do with uh, his life? It's still not certain. Could be IT, could be medicine. Don't know. Well, he's pretty young. Uh, our our, our uh, one son, John, always wanted to be a medical doctor, even with his little boy. But Richard was not sure until he went to college what he wanted. Not everybody knows. So, can we do a, a short sum up? So, you have no trouble in using this word marriage, even though it's shifted in a lot of there ways. There isn't another word. I, no one has come up with another word that we could use. And people think of it as meaning you have a ceremony, you, you get married, you stay together, and there's what people think of it as. Yeah, but that's... You know, the, the ceremony and the, the attributes like a dress and the guests and so on, it's just uh, a decoration. It, it's not... It, it doesn't last, for, the it doesn't last for 50 years. Yeah, what, what, uh, what Bob and I have is marriage. What we have is marriage. We've been married all these years, and uh, that's marriage. And what we have, the definition of what we have, we use the word marriage because we don't have another one. Is there another one in Russian? I mean, maybe English is just limited. There is, I don't, there's no other word. No, I don't know any synonyms. Well, sometimes they use words like uh, partnership or... Uh, yeah, but you use that in business. <laughs> well, technically, yeah. if it was a kind of a financial contract, which could be enforceable, then partnership would be uh, okay. Jesus, yeah. Like, uh, I, 
I, I don't see no reason why we we don't have uh, like several different types. If it was if it was up to me, I would do several different types. Like, you want a partnership? Here's the legal pathway. Okay, it's partnership. You want a marriage in a religious sense? Okay, there is a a path for this. For example, in partnership, you could have a divorce, <laughs> and in religious marriage, you could not. For example. That's like one of the things in, in which it could, they could be different, and then and financial differences also, and the children uh, differences about children, and so on. I don't know if in today's world it'd be pretty hard to get someone to agree to a marriage where divorce was not a possibility, because what if your husband becomes a serial cheater and he is beat you? You know, and there's no way out. You're stuck. Well, what if a wife stops having sex with you, and you have no right to go anywhere else? <laughs> well, that that's, that is, see, in fasting womanhood, we say not in my mother's book, but in mine, that when you marry a man, if he's a moral man, you you take him off the market, and it's not right to. Um, to do that and and then just deny him some of his basic needs. And it doesn't mean that you should have to do things that you're really uncomfortable with in sex, but that you should not, um, it's not right to, for him, he agrees to that you will have an exclusive relationship. And then if you deny that, that is not right. And uh, it isn't right. Because then if, if, he's, if he's religious or just very moral, he doesn't want to feel like he's cheating, so he can't continue to be this good guy, and and um, and yet you denied those very basic things, which I think makes sense to you. It's it's not right to do that to take a guy off the market and then just now that I have you, you're not getting any of this. You know, it's it's not right. My point was, a sexual thing was just an example. I was just thinking about it, that uh, a wife has uh, possibilities to ruin the life of a husband in many different ways. <laughs> the sexual and vice versa. Both do. Both do. Yeah, yeah. I, I and mean, so, so, so what? somehow people survived with, without divorce. So it was possible. Uh, sometimes they lived apart for years. I mean, you know, uh, Benjamin Franklin did not have a good marriage with his wife, Deborah, and he, I mean, I don't like it, but reading, he wrote it in his own book. And he, you know, when he was in Europe, he had mistresses, and he did, I don't think he saw for like 17 years. He just lived in Europe. And he was negotiating the Revolutionary War to get King Louis to help us with, with uh, troops and stuff and uh, his wife he would send letters home instructing her what color to paint the house I mean he was still kind of controlling her from France over in the colonies and he wasn't even there and she ended up dying before she ever, before he ever came back so he kind of abandoned her and they didn't get divorced she just was sort of stuck and he had all these women in France and taking baths with them and doing all kinds of stuff. So it's always been around. Abuse of marriage has always been around. Both sides, men or women. It'd be nice if you could have a, a matchmaker that 100% guaranteed to match you with a person who would just be perfect for you, but it doesn't exist. Everybody would love that. Somebody you would Get a little smile on your face every time you thought of them. Um, in a good way. In a good I'm way. I'm not sure I should have said it, but uh, there, there were, and there are some people that put a smile on my face just okay. thinking about them. But they were not related <laughs> to the family. So, oh, that's okay. So I think we can close this topic on uh, this meaning of the word marriage. Okay. We, we would. If, if if we could, we could change a lot of things. But yeah, some sometimes some things just left for us to to experience, not to change. And we can but, change ourselves. We can change ourselves in many ways, not all everything. We, and, uh, but we can 
I, I try to be a little more like Rob. He looks at everything optimistic. I'm, I wish I was more like that. He's, he loves every day and finds things to love about every single day. I'm a worrier. I worry, and that's one of my weaknesses. I don't like it, and I've never been able to quite conquer it, but I'm doing, I'm doing better, but it's hard for me. I'm a worrier, and uh, he isn't. So every day for him is a new adventure, a new experience, and he's finds, he lies in bed every morning and thinks about everything he's really grateful for and thinks about them, and then he feels the feelings of gratitude, and it sets him up for his whole day. Because he said there's always things, like he's sometimes grateful that um, he can see. He has patients who are blind. He's grateful that uh, you know, he has a car to drive that works, and he's grateful that you know we have a house to live in. And he's always says he's always grateful for me, and... He, can, he says the things he's grateful for, there's so many of them, and he has to limit it. And everybody has things to be grateful for. Um, sincerely, not just superficially, but sincerely grateful for health, for that you can walk, and um, that you have a good intellect. You're bright. Of course, if you weren't, you wouldn't care. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think about it. <laughs> but, if, you know, you would uh, you would not know the difference if you were had a sixty IQ. You wouldn't. In fact, some of Bob's patients that have said, "I'm really bright. I have a really high IQ." Those are the ones that have the low. People that are more intelligent don't think they're as smart as they are usually, because they realize there's people smarter, and so they think, "Well, I'm, you know. they realize how much they don't know." People who aren't so smart. Think they know so much it's just it's just kind of an interesting human thing but there's always things to be grateful for and um, look um, this media we would never know who each other was if it weren't for this I'm grateful you can speak English because I can't speak Russian <laughs> and I'm grateful that I, I was able to find you and that you contacted me and you you were <laughs> Can I ask you how did you how did you learn English so well? Nothing special. Just I was a lazy pupil at school, and then after after my school, I got two year courses from my job, and that's technically all I had. After afterwards, just some practice with uh, our colleagues. You must have a talent for language because your English is really good. But I don't think so. <laughs> I tried German four four times. I tried to start German. No, no luck. It was a, a bit easier with French and a bit easier with uh, Chinese, but I did not study Chinese, them. Chinese, yes. Chinese was easier than German? I, I tried a bit, yeah, but ch Chinese wow. for me was easier than German, yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, how many languages do you speak? Uh, only, only two. Oh, Normally I can only speak. If you can well, call this uh, speaking, well, uh, I, I don't speak really well in English so I don't oh yes you do you understand I don't feel uh, limited in what I say to you and some uh, like my um, some people I've known that are learning English I, I have to I talk really slow when I talk to them so so that they can understand better um, but I just talk normal speed with you and you seem to understand everything um, yes, in, in a passive way, I'm, I understand most of it. I can watch a new movie and I don't need, most of the time I don't need a translation. Even if I don't hear anything, I, I, can, I can guess what's, what's missing. But this talking is a different, different thing. You, you need, really need a practice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, different than reading, isn't it? Yeah. So, in this now, sense, Valeria, I don't have much. Valeria wants to show us some Russian films. Of course, they would have English subtitles uh, because she and Richard have been watching some. And Richard said there's some fantastic movies in Russia. Of course, I've never seen uh, really good directors, stories. There is a movie called, um, uh, about, I'm not sure what's the English title, about Baron uh, uh, Munchausen. 
the Soviet movie. Oh. You should, you should watch it. What's it called? I guess in English it should sound like The Münchhausen. The Münchhausen. Is that German? Is that a German word? Mm, well, the name, the name is German. Baron Münchhausen, this, uh, the okay. guy who was okay. making up stories about his uh, adventures and travel and so on. But the Soviets took a, a very special angle on his life. Are there any movies about Peter the Great that are good? Yeah, several. Many, actually. I think ten, maybe more. That's, that's what I know, the greatest movies. Maybe uh, there are some less well-known. Mm. Yeah, a lot of them. That would be, I would like to do that. I've, I've been watching Korean films, and some of them are very good, too. Korean, Korean, uh, yeah. Kim Ki-duk, yeah. You should, you well, some. our daughter Lisa is in Korea, and so she recommends mm. films with English subtitles. And some of them are very good. There's some really good actors in some of these films. I just, wow. The old boy, old boy. Uh, oh, that one? Oh, boy? Lisa told me, don't see that one. You won't like it. Richard saw it. He loved it. It's probably you won't. You, probably you won't like it, but it's a great movie anyway. That's what. That, yeah, you've heard of it. I'll tell Richard you've heard of it. Did you watch it? Yeah, yeah several times. It sounds too disturbing to me, like nightmare time of stuff. So Richard and Lisa both said, "Don't watch it, Mom. You won't like it." But they were raving about it. They were downstairs here watching it, and they said, "Don't." But it had subtitles, so I even though I hear Kurd stuff, I couldn't understand the Korean. But, yeah, old boy, they, yeah, they don't. So you watch Korean films? Yeah, from time to time, yeah. My goodness, you're very well educated. Well, it's not education, it's, it's entertainment. It may, maybe yeah, but you're interested in things from different countries. Uh, some people here, some, well, it seems like all they're interested in is action movies uh, with a lot of um, CG and special effects, and same kind of stuff over and over. Killing, violence, robots, all that kind of stuff. And you you look at a lot of different things. In the group I mentioned, uh, that that's the movie that you, I think you would like it. Uh, L'Eternité. Eternity. Eternity? Eternity, the French one. Oh, maybe, it's maybe, French? Maybe, yeah. Strange. What's what's it about? Uh, a family, several generations of family. That's the short version. But that 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 would be your 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 type of movie. I think you you would, you would like it. You would love it. And if and if possible, watch it on a big screen with with a high quality uh, image because it really each 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 frame is if you stop it, it looks like a painting. Really? Yeah. I'm gonna, as soon as we're off, I'll write it down and have Richard try to find it. I think it, in, in English it's called Eternity, and in, in French, original, uh, Le Eternité. There was, there was a, a French film called Ponette years ago that Lisa found that she watched with Richard, and it was really good, but it was so sad. I don't know if I could see it again. Really well acted. Little kids in there whose parents were killed in a car crash, and... I don't know where they found these children to act so well. It seems so real, what they went through. And, um, but it was too sad seeing it happen, seeing their lives. What happened to these little children? It was really hard. But it was so well done. I still remember. By the way, uh, Amelie. Have you seen Amelie? Amelie. The, the movie called Amelie. Have you seen it? No, but my sister, is it... With Audrey Toto. Is it on Netflix? Not sure. Could be. But it's an old one. It's already uh, maybe 10 years or even more. I think that might be the one my sister was telling me about. She said I would really like it. Yeah. I guess so. And it's actually the same actress as it is in uh, The Eternity. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, then I'm going to see if Richard can find that one. Have you seen, you watch American films, don't you? Most of the times, 
I'll never come over here, Seattle. Okay, this is going to be embarrassing. Here, have you ever watched an old film called The Russians Are Coming? Sounds familiar, but not sure. Not sure. I love, I love that movie. Um, it's kind of comedy, but it's it is. Um, I think it was in the seventies. It's in color, but it is supposed to be a Russian submarine gets breaks down on the shore of a little island just off the United States. It's just it's part of the United States. It's kind of a vacation island, and all these people are there, and they think the Russians are attacking. It's in the Cold War, and the townspeople are so funny because they're so they're not sophisticated at all. They they go crazy. They think, oh no! And the Russians, uh, the head Russian is played by Alan Arkin, if you know who he is, and he's really good. Um, I don't know if his Russian's good. He speaks in Russian, but he's the Russians. Uh, sailors that come ashore to try and get help, they're, they're really normal and logical, and the townspeople are the ones that are going crazy. They think that bombs are going to start flying and all this stuff. They just, they just kind of go crazy, and the poor Russian sailors just want help getting off, getting unstuck. from. They, they came too close to shore because they were curious to see what America looked like, and they got stuck. So they needed someone to help get him off the sandbar and get him back out to the ocean. That's all they needed. But the whole story is around how people think that now is the day that Russians are attacking or it's going to be World War III. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of funny. It, uh, Richard showed it to Valeria uh, when, he, when they were first married, and she didn't really get it very well, but her English was still a little rough. But uh, she... She thought the Americans were acting really stupid, but they were supposed to. That's what the whole movie was about. They were acting really ignorant, and uh, like a lot of people are. And it was nothing. It was just they were just stuck. And then when the townspeople, in the end, they, they realize why they're actually there, the whole town gets out in their little boats, and they help pull their submarine out. So they're all friends then, and they all wave and say they want to see each other again and all that stuff. So. I thought it was cute. It was really cute. If you get a chance to see it, it's Americans laughing at themselves at how ridiculous the whole thing <laughs> is. And if you do see it, tell me if you think their Russian is any good, because I don't I really know. <laughs> Usually in American movies, uh, that's, that's really rare. That they really took some Russian. Well, did you see um, uh, Hunt for Red October with Sean Connery? Yeah, sure. Well, Valeria said that Sean Connery's Russian was horrible, and he didn't. She couldn't even understand him. <laughs> Is that what you thought? Normally, they just sometimes when they want to do it uh, right, they they just take uh, uh, Russians or ex-Russians, like in uh, Lord of War, one of my favorite movies, Lord of War. There's a lot of Russian. Even Nicolas Cage is speaking some Russian, and not 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 that bad actually. <laughs> It's well, Sean Connery can't. Sean Connery can't get past his Scottish accent. <laughs> it's <laughs> I, even I can hear his Scottish accent with his Russian, and he he's just. I can tell he's got the Scottish accent when he's trying to say these Russian words. And Valeria just rolled her eyes like, "Oh, brother!" He doesn't say. He, he <laughs> should have just spoken English because it doesn't sound Russian to her at all. That's a problem usually in the movies. <laughs> Well, anyway, it's been good talking to you. Thank you very much. It was interesting. I will try to edit and put it in the in the it's inner line and in the context. I hope it isn't too horribly long. But anyway. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot, and I hope we will do this again sometime. Yeah, it's fun. I appreciate it. Thanks, Sergey. Thank bye bye. See ya.